Erzählen. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to Dumb SEO Questions, episode 297. Uh, each week we meet here to uh, um, answer the questions asked on the SEO Questions community on Google Plus and the Dumb SEO Questions Facebook group. With us today, we have Masataki Wasa. Masataki is webmaster of wasaweb.net in the UK. Um, he's also a Google top contributor on the uh, uh, Google AdSense uh, community. William Rock, uh, he's a, a Google top contributor on the AdSearch. He's a, an SEO, proud to call himself an SEO from um, uh, Kansas. Okay, and um, it's web search is is your favorite uh, place on? Uh, yep. Okay. That would be a great uh, section in the forums to help. Absolutely. Terrific. Uh, Tim Kappa. Um, Tim Kappa is not found. A hot tub he wouldn't jump into. Uh, Tim is uh, uh, CEO of OnlineOwnership.com. And he's also a Google top contributor on the, uh, um, what is it, Google local community. No, it's Google my business community, sorry. And uh, the oldest man in SEO is David Rosam, 30 years experience uh, as a copywriter, the last 12 as an SEO copywriter. David can be found at writingforseo.org. Did I get it right? No, you're muted, uh, David. I, I, I'm just getting lost on this this new interface thing here. You know, us old people have trouble with uh, with changes. Uh, DavidRosen.com is another good place to find me. Okay, DavidRosen.com. I, I mispronounce it so that people understand phonetically the the, the, the letters of the the whole thing. All <laughs> right. We're, uh, 22 questions tonight, and uh, we'll begin with the, the first one. Uh, it's titled, uh, Google continues to show the uh, uh, bad description um, in all searches. It's from Scott Clark. Scott said, we have a site that my team have done site-wide meta description updates. The originals looked uh, almost like uh, random text. Despite a month's elapsed time, Google continues to show the bad uh, descriptions on all searches unless um, we look at the updated pages with a, a site operated search uh, like site full colon domain.com, which presumably takes uh, Google's uh, improvements out of the equation. They're written for humans. The length and relevance of the descriptions are spot on. And it is not keyword stuffed or otherwise offensive to Google guidelines. They are highly relevant to the pages and the test queries. What other tests could we do to isolate the cause and repair this? I was just reading through some of the notes. Typically, when Google doesn't show the actual description, is because the actual description is not as relevant to the same content on the web page itself. So as long as you're going um, and providing very similar to you would do for an AdWords campaign, um, you would actually do the, the right you know, call to action on your title and your description there. So as long as you're doing that consistently on your page, you should be able to have a title and description show up just as you guys are putting it um, without even having to submit back to the search engines. I've done it many times and it comes um, within probably one day, sometimes even a few hours and showing up in the actual index. Uh, other times it's a matter of rec if you're doing it to every page in your site and a whole lot of them, and maybe that's actually uh, having Google recrawl it with uh, resubmitting your site map. Thank you, William. Anybody else? I must call out uh, people like Stock 
Stockbridge Truslow, who uh, the uh, uh, forum heroes that uh, uh, make themselves available to answer questions um, throughout the week. Um, it's um, much appreciated. All right, um, let's um, call that one a, an answer and let's go to the next. This one um, is um, from um, um, Jotrin Chan. Um, he says, um, how, how do I build the backlinks um, for my site? Um, it, is, it, is it really important for my site rank? Yes. Okay. Uh, right. So, Jotin, it all depends on um, what you are competing for. If you are, uh, let's say, if you are a, um, a dentist in a town where there are another kind of 10 dentists you know uh you can quite easily uh position yourself um number one without any links just on um you know structuring the site correctly and providing uh better content um on site than any of the other 10. if you are a dentist in a major city where there may be another hundred thousand dentists um uh, again structuring your site properly and providing the you know a pro proper structured content service pages etc should put you in the region of kind of roughly around page two let's say page three um and then yes unfortunately you do need to rely on uh some links now they don't necessarily have to be in what you term thinking about a link and a, a, a link coming from some kind of article somewhere. Uh, links for a local business could come from a range of uh, really good places. Um, so for example, Chamber of Commerce, trade organizations, any registered things, you know, like obviously a dentist would need to be registered with a medical association uh links coming back from the university they went to their alumni things like that things things like that could put them page one if you're talking about a generic um kind of uh let's say an online shoe shop well in that instance you are going to need to start relying on a lot more sort of um links that would define you as an authority shoe seller online right um and essentially how do you build backlinks now if we look at google's definition um look links in order for it to be seen as um a a, a link in google's eyes has to be natural right and if you look at in terms of google's definition how would you attract a natural link you would generally, if you look at it, how if you come across something online, you generally only tend to share something that you found <laughs> interesting, that you found interesting, or provided value to you. So if you found something interesting, you would either share it socially, or for example, if you had a blog, or you were inclined, or you were writing about something, and someone had written about something, that was particularly interest um, and that could be built within to your article, that is how you generally attract a natural link. So in that instance, you are satisfying a user's query and you are providing something of value. And obviously links don't necessarily need to be on page. You know, there's a whole well range of ways that people can actually refer to you. It could be uh, in a video, you know, a very, very well written video. Someone says, hey, you've got to check out the site. They do brilliant shoes. Um, it could be, uh, you know, same again on social, you know, uh, Kim Kardashian wearing your shoes guide. You've got to check out the site kind of thing. Um, so you're providing something of value to someone that either answers the question or 
or, or satisfies a need, um, which is generally the way someone will then uh, link to you or share a link or resource pointing towards your business or brand. Um, so that's a natural way of doing it, uh, providing you know something of value that somebody wants to share. He's Please hating. Turn. He's he's hating me right now. I can see Jotron hating on me now. <laughs> <laughs> okay uh, anybody else all right let's uh, go to the next this one from jack zhang um jack uh, asked a question titled uh, changing the page title on load with javascript um, he said, uh, hi, I had a question regarding changes to the page title. This is the way one of my pages uh, is set up. One, initial page load. Two, immediate Ajax call to retrieve more data. Three, the page title changed according to results from Ajax data. When the page is first loaded, the title is something like placeholder title. When the page is loaded, an Ajax call is performed and the title is changed to a real title. Does Google take into account changes to the title due to JavaScript? Or is the initial page title the only thing Google looks at? I think so. Thanks, Jack. See, Federico Sasso has given us an, an answer. Um, on the um, uh, SEO questions community on Google Plus. I would have thought, I mean, tell me if I'm wrong, but uh, I would have thought that, um, um, you know, I mean, for, for, for decades we've, we've used the Lynx browser to check and Lynx won't run Ajax or uh, JavaScript. Um, but Googlebot um, apparently is getting better, but um, <coughs> Googlebot's not not going to um, run a script to, to pick up a, a different um, a, a different page title. Um, what what the purpose of the dynamically creating title tag? If they're pulling something like the cookie of the search query uh, and putting the actual keyword in the title based off of, uh, I think that that would be counterproductive, but um, I mean, realistically, you're creating a page, each page that you have on your website should have consistent information and something that's not changing as quickly as a dynamic piece would. Now I can see it for other purposes, but not necessarily the title and description. Uh, maybe the headline or heading maybe being changed, but that's still kind of uh, devious to, you know, terms of service I would imagine from Google. They want to see what's going to be shown to the visitor as they crawl. Like you mentioned, utilizing a tool like links, it's not, it's not going to actually fire the JavaScript, so it's not going to see the true information. It's almost kind of like utilizing uh, Google Optimize and having one thing show versus the other thing show, you know, kind of an A-B split test. Um, it's kind of tricky because I think you're going you're gonna to go back to what is it showing in the actual search results when, when somebody's looking for that page, like going maybe into Search Console and pulling up a page itself, looking at the queries, and then, you know, looking in incognito to see kind of what those uh, pages look like with your content. And you could probably quickly see if that dynamic content is being pulled versus a static that you have defaulted? Yeah, and I just thought of another thing. Uh, um, he could look at, uh, go, go to uh, Google, do a site uh, operator search to, to bring up all his pages and check the, um, the cache, um, yeah. particularly the text only version of the cache. Um, and uh, that will that will show him. And, is that a good idea? Yeah, no, that shows you pretty quickly what Google is going to actually show. I mean, that's where the, the good part is when, I mean, even when you're doing an ad preview 
and AdWords. I mean, you're seeing what Google is actually displaying to the visitor. Um, same thing with the site um, operator. You're you're seeing what's in the cache. So whatever they have up there, you're going to identify quickly if that's, you know, if your dynamic content, your script is actually running or not. But I would imagine it's probably not. And it, it, it you might see based off of what you were saying, uh, you know, placeholder. You may actually see placeholder in what Google sees. So if that's the case, then I probably wouldn't run the job script. Yeah. It does seem a bit of a strange thing to do. I'm sitting here scratching my head, uh, my old and gray and wizened head, as uh, as Jim would have it, probably. Um, it's, uh, I, I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to, to insult Jack here, um, I'm, but uh, I, what, what hits me in the face is, what um why is it being done it just sound you know why would you want to change the page title as you load the page it's it it sounds like a, a very strange piece of thinking um you know the kind of thinking that says the pre that the precise uh words in the in the title tag um will have a a great amount um, of bearing on the performance of that page in the SERPs. And of course, it's just one thing. Or is this whole page being rewritten somehow? Uh, are, are there um, are, are there variable um, words in, in, in a copy? Are, are there alternative blocks of, of paragraphs or sections or whatever? Sounds very odd. Sound yeah, it sounds like trying to trying to gain Google, um, and whether um, whether Google will read it or not is or is one question. But you know, even if it does, will Google actually give you any um, uh, any uh, any, uh, any advantage for doing so? Um, yeah, I think I think there are other questions here. Yeah, I totally agree with you there, David. I mean, yeah. Um, essentially, if you wanted to change the title of that page as it's loading, uh, why don't you just create another page with that particular title, uh, and then create the content to go with that? Uh, I really don't see what you're trying to achieve or how it would be achieved by changing the title when it's loading. Uh, yeah. Maybe he could be doing something like, you've already landed on it, and then he's changing it to say something like, welcome, I, 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 for example. You know, oh, no, yeah, I don't know, uh, uh, yeah. Maybe we're talking about the actual H1 as the page title versus the page title that. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure, but it's like if a person clicked into that page for that specific display in the SERPs saying pink fluffy elephants, and now I click on here and it's already magically changing to pink warthogs, two different pink animals, the one I wanted, the one I don't want. And it you know, it just, it, yeah, I don't, from a user's perspective, they believe they're coming in to see something and then they just get a warthog. And you don't want a warthog, do you really? No. Nah. Nah. It could ruin your day entirely. It could, mate. Well, especially it if you wanted a pink fluffy elephant. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it defeats the whole thing about user experience, and I would imagine that. In your analytics, you'll be able to see the, the page bounce. Okay. Any further thoughts before we move on? Okay, we can call this an answer for Jack. I hope uh, that's what you're looking for, Jack. Um, all right. So, um, welcome to Mike Fisher Kirshner, um, who's just joined us from the uh, East Coast of the USA. 
No, the West Coast. No, what is it? Yeah, this is the West Coast. <laughs> All right, um, let's uh, move on to the next question on our run, run list. Uh, it's number four. Um, it's titled, uh, The Best Way to Hide Specific Products from the Website, from Casey Kushik, who asked, if I need to hide some specific pro products from the website, what would be the best way to do that? I don't want to remove or take down the products because that will create broken links. And then those broken links um, will have to be redirected, which I, I don't want. Um, I've done the wrong thing here. Yeah, there we go. Um, actually, we had a quality issue with our base ingredient and we don't want anyone to order them online. Uh, we could possibly discontinue the line, but that has not been decided yet. I know I can make those products out of stock to stop ordering those products, but it does not seem to be the best solution. Please, if you guys share, if you guys could share any ideas, I would really appreciate it. You're welcome, Jack. Uh, sorry, KC Kushik. Um, he said thanks, and uh, he's welcome. The question asked on Google Plus. Yeah, so um, I know he said uh, we could mark them out of stock, but the, but the point, the whole point. Look, I don't, I don't know what you're using, but if you, for example, um, if you're using, for example, WooCommerce and you mark it out of stock, it actually removes it out of the navigation. It doesn't break it, doesn't make it a 410. I'm not actually sure what it marks it as in the header code. I've never checked. I've never thought to look but it removes it out of the navigation so that uh it's not in the navigation for the user they can't like you know and unless they're coming from an old link somewhere and they actually happen to land on it it then will say this is out of stock uh at the minute um so you're not 404 and it's not broken it's still there it's just taken out of the navigation when it's back in stock you just click uh, in stock again, and then it automatically puts it back into the navigation where it was. So um, first thing I would look at is just have a look at your CMS. Um, it may already have an option for that. Thank, thank you, Tim. Yeah, and the other thing I probably do, I mean, Tim, correct me if I'm wrong, but make sure that you actually take it out of your sitemap um, and just has a no index, no follow. You can always put it back in when you, if, you know once you fix the ingredient problem, and then it, uh, Google will actually refine it. Yeah, actually, you're spot on there because, funny enough, as I was mentioning WooCommerce, um, which takes it out of the navigation, it marks it out of stock, etc. Unfortunately, it doesn't do it with the sitemap. Now, um, hopefully, WooCommerce will sort something like that out. Ultimately, if it gets marked out of stock, it comes out of the sitemap. Uh, which they haven't done at the minute. So, uh, yeah, certainly, definitely have a look at that. Cool. Anybody else? All right. Uh, Casey Kushik, that is your answer. Okay. This one from um, Kostutis Pazerskis. Uh, Kostutis uh, asked a question titled internal linking in main menu navigation. Um, he said, what do you think of linking to the most important pages here? I've heard some negative thoughts uh, about the same anchor text for links in here uh, because the link will appear in all pages and Google takes just a first link in, in the HTML um, as an anchor. Um, as a result, uh, those most important pages will have 100% uh, the same anchor text. So, I mean, I'm not sure I follow why, um, well, two things. Um, I'm not sure why I follow, he has to have the, the links in the main nav be all the same. Um, he can always make, like have them be you uh, have, the anchor text can always be used differently for each one. 
Um, secondarily, in terms of kind of the first anchor text, that's not necessarily true. I mean, Google doesn't necessarily come in and um, in order always review the exact link in the in the same um, place every time. So, um, yeah, and Michael Martinez notes the you know, it's it's the same thing. Um, I I definitely would include them in in the main navigation um, if they are the most important links because that is also site wide. Um, so that's not something that I would uh, necessarily actually worry about. Yeah, yeah. I mean, just just think of it from the sense that you've probably seen, uh, and I don't know because you haven't. I don't know what your site is, but you've probably seen tons of sites that have breadcrumbs at the top, and you know. It's got home or whatever that you know, and then it'll say pink fluffy elephants, and then it'll go elephant slippers. And things like that. It you know what it does is it shows the person where the, where they are in the site. <laughs> so not only is it useful for the user to know where they are in the site, because if they've clicked on something too far, I don't know about you, but a lot of users use actually the use the breadcrumbs to go back to the previous category that they were in because they knew that was the last page. So it makes sense for users. It makes sense for Google to understand the structure of the site. So I think if I was you, I would rather, you know, just relook at your navigation. It probably sounds a little bit off somehow. But also if you're internally linking somewhere else, it, it, you know, if it makes sense for a user, think about a user, if it makes sense for a user for it to be redirected to X, Y, or if somebody's in, I know, let's say you've just got a massive, massive product stock list kind of thing, you know, and some, sometimes there are these kind of sites which are, you know, really, really long and deep. Yeah, so when you're getting into the bowels of the site, sometimes it does make sense to read, uh, you know, to have a link um, just back to either the main category for that another section. Um, think, think like, uh, for example, Amazon. I mean, these person, you know, but they also link back to that main product category that originally originated from where you can then go back and refine your possible search within that category. So in those instances, yeah, you know, um, but it, it's more about user navigation and, and user. And when you think about that, that's how Google also looks at it and defines it. Uh, you know, if if just yeah, just 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 try and think about the user and then follow on from how Google is going to be seeing it because Google isn't just uh, oh link that's it. I'm going to take it as given. You know, they they work through the rest. So if you're also selling a table, and in that you actually link to the to to the tablecloths, it makes sense because tablecloth goes on a table, it completely makes sense. So don't, you know, yeah. Direct direct users as would make sense and stop trying to sort of interpret how Google's gonna see things. Yeah, great point, I mean, when you're, when you're uh, for the example of the table on a tablecloth, I mean, then that's when you're gonna have inter, uh, additional navigation that are focused around that one theme. Um, now, if you're taking that navigation and just taking every single one of your keywords and just putting it as an app, that could cause a problem. But going back to Tim's example, a, uh, you know, user experience. Look at how they're going to navigate through your site. Are they going to find what they're looking for consistently? And then focus on your page copy. What are you trying to, once they're there, what are you doing then to increase the relevancy of that page to the user experience? That's what probably is going to help you with Google versus paying attention to the left navigation. Thank you, William. Anybody else? Okay, Sturtis Pazerskis. Uh, I, um, I think um, you should be happy with that. Um, also, I must call out um, um, Michael Martinez, who's a stalwart uh, on our uh, Facebook group, um, answering questions uh, through the week. It's very much appreciated. All right, uh, let's um, move on to the next. This one from another one from Jotran Chan. 
He said, I don't know how to optimize the product details page. There are too many products on the company's website. I don't know how to op optimize the product details page. Some products have a very low search volume. Should I abandon them? Um, no. <clears throat> so, so this is the way I'd look at it. So, I mean, I've um, often dealt with, and I'm, it's, it's kind of suspect you're into some really one of those types of sites where you've got a particular screw head uh, that varies in slightly by diameter, slightly by length, slightly by um, the, the type of metal, for example. So essentially, you've got one product, and then, you know, it's, in one sense, it's essentially one product, but it, they are individual products in their own, right? But they're all the same. And it's like, well, how do I make something like this sound sexy? You know, it's not. It's essentially the same thing, the same alloy, just a slightly different size or shape or whatever. Um, and you've got tons of these. Right. So the way I've found works pretty effectively is, is to then work on the actual category or the top line category section that these are in. So these might be quarter inch stainless steel screws, right? If you've obviously going to have a category for your quarter inch stainless steel screws. You provide then an introduction into it saying, you know, blah, 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 and a little bit more tech spec. Um, and then, you know, which allows, which is the page that you then want to position itself rather than the quarter inch stainless steel screw with a, you know, with, a, with an S curve and then quarter inch stainless steel with a J curve. Um, you rather want to position the category rather than all those other things because the, the, the content is all the same of those. It's going to all be the same. So I would rather uh, use your category page for that to provide better information. And if you provide any kind of guide or technical spec in your guide or resource section on these screws, then I would link it to the, the actual category page which then, although there's very, very low um, search volume for this, your category page will be appearing, and then users wanting to look for these kind of screws would click in there and then find the screw they need. And that's the one that would rank, and that's the one that reads better. That's the one that would then direct them into the actual product. So that's the way I've worked, and it's worked pretty well. Um, you're not bothering too much with the products, you're just leading it to the main top line section of the category for those guys. Thank you, Tim. Anybody else? Uh, I like Michael's thing about having the site search tool. Very cool. In fact, we were just the only problem with site search tool is depending on what you're using, sometimes you have to educate your site search tool. Um, and you'll have to check back weekly on who's searched for what, and then you say, okay, I'll take that, and then you've got to assign products or categories to do that. So um, it depends which one you use or how you use it. Don't forget to teach it or train it. Yeah, I, I see Magento has um, come out um, with a, um, a predictive site search. So they type a, a, a few letters in, maybe the brand and the start of the model. And um, the um, um, search uh, is a big drop down and uh, it contains, you know, um, something pretty close to um, the user's query and they can actually select from the drop down. Um, that is a cool thing. All right, um, anybody else? Okay, let's go to the next. This one from Jay Lowe. Um, yeah, Jay Lowe. Um, impression and visits drop while the average position stays stable. stable. <clears throat> and I said, uh, Recently, I found a lot of people complaining about their impressions and visitors drop while the average position stays stable. 
I'm wondering uh, in what circumstance this can logically happen. All I can think about uh, is all the high volume keywords are completely removed from the index, leaving those low volume ones with a stable position. Is that a possible uh, explanation? Uh, well, <clears throat> uh, there are a couple of potentialities on this. Um, one is if just Google changes how it um, factors impression volume data. Uh, sometimes they do change stuff up, so you have to you know, wait a couple of days and then they might mark a little line on there and let you know. Um, other things that can happen, um, it may be that um, the you had a few terms or maybe even just one term where it garnered a lot of impressions and um, visits uh, and that dropped off completely but it was equatable to whatever your your average position was um, the, uh, so that's let's say, I'd say those two um, sometimes there's bugs uh, in fact the one that was just on the, well, I wouldn't call it a bug, but now, but at the time, uh, roughly around, what is it, the 19th, uh, Google made a change to its system so that if you're running a query, uh, specifically in a brand uh, query, then Google takes out um, specific, what they call anonymous data um, from, from the chart itself. Uh, so that might be as well another thing to <coughs> keep in mind. Um, those are probably, I'd say, the more common reasons for that, but there might be some others I'm missing offhand. Yeah, good points. I think also it depends on the tool that you're using to get that data. I've only, I've always suggested to use that as a, just a gauge ballpark. Don't, don't look at it as an, uh, an actual number. I mean, if you're bidding on those keywords, then yes, that could probably give a better accurate information from the bid uh, management tool where they're telling you how many impressions or tra much traffic you're probably going to get from that. Um, but you're also having to think of consideration what is your your CTR, your click-through ratio, based on those impressions. Is it very low? Um, is, you know, what is also the relevance for, I mean, if you, I like to take the keyword into a paid environment and then run it against a couple, maybe a hundred dollars or something, just to get a better idea of what, what is my quality score? Am I sitting at a one out of 10 or am I sitting at a nine out of 10? Um, and then looking at also what was the engagement rate of that and what I need to uh, tweak my, my call to action, my message, and then also going to follow through. But, um, use that as just a guide. I wouldn't use it as actual numbers. Um, like Mike mentioned, Google's changing the algorithm all the time, so we can only guess. We can kind of see projecting what that's going to be, but it's not, it's not ever really truly the number. I know that our bosses probably want to say, hey, I want all that traffic get it to me. So it's, it's just not possible. Now, you can get a percent, percentage of that traffic and it does absolutely nothing in the conversions goal. So then it's really a waste of time. Thank you, William. Uh, anybody else? Jay Lo, that, that is your lot. And we're on to the next. This one is from Kelly Ann Burns. Where's Tim Kappa when you need him? Um, how much content needs to change uh, to avoid duplicate content? Well, that's a novel thing. We haven't had a question like this before. Um, Kellyanne Byrne said, um, let me see. Uh, click the button. Okay. She said, hi, all. I have a question about duplicate content. I understand you can get ranked down for duplicate content. We wanted to share a message on our website on two different pages. The message would be the same. The product would just differ. Um, we will make slight tweaks. Um, my question is this. Is there a hard and fast rule about how much content needs to change uh, in order for Google not to index the pages as duplicate? Any advice uh, would be appreciated. This is a, a question asked on our SEO questions community on Google+. I mean, there's different opinions about how 
much content is needed or not. Now, there's essentially kind of uh, tools out there for you to look at. Um, in fact, common ones that are used in, say, uh, the academic space include Copy Copyscape. Um, uh, it's so like the ability to kind of check of the familiarity or the similarity between them. Um, you can kind of run tools. Um, you know, part of it is also the utility and the value add that's being created. So uh, the the amount is not something that I would know personally offhand, like what percentage. And personally, in my opinion, it would also vary depending on both internal and external sites for the duplication of your content. Um, and as well as kind of what situation you're you're uh, concerned about. So. Um, for example, are you trying to put a canonical tag between two pages versus, um, you know, creation of two different pages and making sure they're different enough? Uh, because in those situations, for example, canonical tag has to be really close for that to be uh, effective in being used as a, a redirect. Whereas, kind of the differentiation between two separate pages that you're worried about, um, you know, can be quite a bit, you know, different. Um, potentially and still be uh, duplicate depending on uh, the context of the situation. So offhand, um, you know, it's going to be hard to say. Uh, and, and normally it's something where like I might use a tool like, again, Copyscape uh, as a way to kind of help differentiate and, and see how far outside the box I'm generally comfortable with for having a differentiation in different pages. Thank you, Micah. All right, is there anybody else? Okay, let's go to the next. This one is from Ken Banks. Uh, he said, I want my filtered search results to show as a page in Google. I have a large uh, automotive inventory and I would like my unfiltered uh, search results to show as a page. And I don't know how to get it done. If someone searches 2013 Toyota Camry. God knows why anyone would. Um, he said, I, and I have one that is searchable on my site. Uh, how do I get my filtered script, my filtered search engine results page to show as a page on Google? No? What, what does he mean by SRP, guys? He means SERP, search, engine, search result page. Oh, oh, gee, I got it right. Okay. Um, Kagurus has mastered this, or Kagurus has mastered this, so uh, uh, I, I only know it is possible. Mike is leaving us. Thank you, Mike. Safe journey to work. Yep, no problem. Take care. What does he actually mean, this guy? Um, filtered search results. Does he mean parameter queries? I um, yeah. yeah, I think that's what he means. So if you think about it, so for example, your top line navigation would, let's say, be uh, forward slash 2013 Toyota Camry, right? And then out of that, you would pick cam belt, which would then create a parameter query, forward slash cam belt, you know, question mark equals cam belt. And then someone would pick price range or model or whatever, which would create another parameter query. I think you might be talking about the parameter queries. Right. So if you're talking about parameter, qu parameter queries, Ken, um, it all depends on how you've handled them. So it, uh, depending on what, um, so for example, <laughs> depending on what CMS you're using or, or whatever you're using, um, it may have already, you may have already um, taken care of the parameter queries, in which case, the parameter queries could be canonicalized back to the actual originating page, the main page, right? 
in this case forward slash 2013 tour to Camry, um, which people tend to do because a lot of parameter queries create mass amounts of duplicated nonsensical pages. Um, and sometimes, uh, a lot of the times, people deal with parameter queries, uh, or, or like I tend to deal with them in terms of not canonicalizing, but I deal with them depending on how big it is in robots TXT. So first thing is, is if you're on showing, generally it's how Googlebot's going to find those. So because a parameter query, like Google can't go onto your site and then literally search for, you know, it'll get to your 2013 Camry page, but Google is not going to, like the Google bot's not going to then click on cam belts and the length of the cam belt to create that parameter query or your what you call your filtered search results is not going to click on those to create those. The only way these tend to be discovered over time is uh when somebody's actually mentioned it like if you've created a resource page and then said check out our 2013 toyota camry cam belts and you've linked to that uh parameter uh query page then googlebot finds it indexes it right assuming you haven't canonicalized or robots txt that so this would be my first step is double check how your cms or the site has dealt with parameter queries i wouldn't i would be careful in just like if it's actually canonicalizing it i'd be careful in just removing that because ultimately over time you might have a ton of them i would make sure you're canonicalizing the the longer ones that you don't that you don't particularly want and then leaving this one that you do want to show, for example. Um, or if it's been handled in robots TXT, then you adjust the robots TXT to allow that part of the search um, query, parameter query you do want, but retain, uh, but disallow crawling of the others. So then, so that's the first part is, is allowing Google part to, to actually, you know, see that without canonicalizing it or disallowing it, right? Then, as I said before, it's not necessarily going to actually, uh, because it can't click on your buttons to create a parameter query, it needs to find that somewhere. And then, so once you've taken care of the first part, the second part then would be to allow Googlebot to find that query. Um, and essentially a quick little article on your site, a little guide, to your actual particular cam belts uh, for the 2013 Toyota Camry page. Um, and then that would be your, you know, create a little guide and then link to that page and discuss your cam belts and why they're so brilliant and blah, 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 blah. That then creates the link, which will Google will index, which will allow Google to then display that page in search. Okay. Now, um, so I hope that's kind of uh, discussed that or at least answered that for you. Excellent. Thank you, Tim. Um, let me see. All right. So, yeah, look, yeah, I think that's fine. Let's go to the next. This one um, from uh, David Gaskin. Um, he uh, said, okay, I've looked around, but I'm still pretty confused about this one. Structured data, schema.org, microdata, RDFA, RDFA, light, etc. I want to optimize my site to include structured data. Google has demonstrated a, pers a preference for JSON-LD but I'm still seeing um, examples of using schema.org microdata if that is even the same thing to mark up HTML in a page. My question is, should I combine uh, these different types, brackets, use a JSON-LD and do some on-page markup, bracket, 
Um, or should it suffice to have just have a JSON LD in the head of my document on the pages with the information I'm marking up? Does this count as a dumb SEO question? Uh, we're, we're answering it, but I don't think it's all that dumb. Um. Hmm. One thing I would say about implementing schema.org on page is that a lot of times you see people marking just bits and pieces and they don't actually validate. So in that sense, JSON only might be a better option. But if you can properly mark up in a structured and embedded way on page, I cannot see any problems with marking up schema.org on page. Thank you, Masataki. In fact, I mean, uh, and this is just, uh, it's nothing to do with the, the case. Um, it's also, you know, even how you um, actually put the structure of the page. Uh, so, for example, you you look at things like um, uh, Booking.com, right? Booking.com actually it creates the uh, what do you call it? The um, facilities of properties that that are available: swimming pool, air conditioning. Um, uh, double beds, non-smoking, things like that, you know, all these little attributes. Uh, Booking.com doesn't actually mark them up, but because of the site and the repetitive structure of it, Google has actually created rich snippets for these um, because they are so consistent. So if yeah, and I'm not saying, look, I, I would always recommend marking things up. But depending on your site, and if you kept, kept that same structure if through either be products or whatever the case may be, um, sometimes in some cases, as I've just mentioned, you don't actually need to mark up. Google then starts to understand the structure of it, what it pertains to, and actually provides you with the the, the 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 rich snippet if that's what you were wanting uh, for that just a little fun fact kind of thing <laughs> yeah I think it helps to um, organize this you know page properly so that if you're using HTML5 make sure you use header main nav footer all those things so that it's easy to understand for both for machines and for humans. Um, if you, if it's a well-structured site, then it wouldn't be too much of a problem because, um, you know, you probably would, would have the HTML5 tags and also that it would be easy, for example, to implement ARIA tags if need be. So if you can, if the site is properly set up, then it shouldn't be too problematic to add, um, structured, uh, structured data markup or to make or to ensure that site complies in terms of accessibility so yeah i think i think that the question is in a sense um perhaps not the right one to ask right the question really is how well structured generally speaking your pages are Thank you, Mr. Taki. Anybody else? I think I'm finally beginning to start to understand structured data. Well, I, I was just going <clears> to—I <throat> was just going to put a, um, a a simple word in, which is that unless you've got any real <clears throat> solid reason for going away from it. Um, follow what the heck um, Google says to do in such a circumstance. And I can't see much uh, for most 
people and most pages that uh, that that uh, we're faced with, um, Jason LD should be the uh, should be the answer to it. Um, and I think that you know we're, I think we're looking at um, outliers where we're saying go away from it. Um, just my view. <clears throat> Excellent. All right, uh, let's um, move on to the next. Um, let me see. Uh, here we are. David. Oh no, I've, I've gone, gone, and gone too far. I'll just bear with me a second. Okay, David Gaskin has another question for us. Um, it's uh, on creating multiple pages for many different locations slash cities. David said, that, can anyone suggest how to go about creating local pages targeting a specific city while at the same time maintaining a non-local general page around a particular service? Here's an example of what I mean. Uh, say I want to create a page for SEO services that is targeted towards my hometown city, um, yet at the same time maintain a general SEO services page that isn't targeted toward any locality. How would I integ integrate uh, both the pages into the site, uh, into a site navigation sitemap, um, without actually spelling out these pages? I think it would look weird to have multiple pages for the same service, i.e. Um, SEO services Toronto, SEO services Montreal, SEO services, etc. in the nav navigation, for instance. I have some confusion about this because I would like to rank in my home city and I'm 90% sure that adding a local modifier will help me with this. But I don't want to jeopardise the appearance, the appearance or perception of my website. Extending this further, what would be your approach to creating multiple pages for many different locations? Thanks. Yeah, uh, it sucks. It looks crap. Um, you know, it it doesn't it, it doesn't look good and. If you, for example, Toronto, Montreal, um, I don't know which one you're in. Are they both the same? I don't know. Is Montreal in Toronto? I have no idea. Um, but a state and city, which I'm assuming one or the other is, um, you know, you 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 can you can generally target these in two ways. So you've got um, your GMB connected. Now, just before I carry on. Um, you're creating multiple of these for different places. It just looks, it just looks crap. Uh, but actually, it still works for um, smaller areas where there's um, where there's uh, not a lot of competition. Uh, so it still does work. Uh, but in a fair-sized area, um, it doesn't really work uh, unless you obviously build a lot of stuff towards that. Uh, and things like that and yeah you know it can it can eventually rank but it looks rubbish because the person lands on that and then looks at your main offering and it's like well what's the difference yeah, anyway it's just yeah um but the way i would do it is it, you know your 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 main site is obviously seo or on your main page your main your main business as a whole operates within a state um and that's what i would have your main site um working with as a state and then when you get down to your specific pages like uh you know seo and things like that i would then be integrating with your gmb with your uh you know your your local citations and things like that which would then uh allow google to understand that you operate within that city and you wouldn't necessarily need to uh, be modifying all sorts of different things everywhere. Um, Google understanding where you are. Um, I would obviously recommend on your main SEO page is just having a little thing. It could even be in your footer saying we're in, you know, we're in X city, um, 
servicing the entire whatever state it is. It could be something as, as little as that, which, you know, m makes sense, looks good. Um, so that's how I would do it. Um, I would use my main site, like the entire site as on the state level. And when it comes down to specific actual things, then I would use my GMB, integrate that into my site. My structured data obviously includes your address, so Google knows which city and state you're in, uh, which would be in your citations anyway also. Uh, and you will naturally start appearing uh, within those. Um, and, and, and that's generally the way you, you, you do it. But as for location pages itself, they look pretty naff. But on the flip side, depending on the competition, they still work. Thank you, Tim. Anybody else? All right, so let's go to the question that uh, I jumped to by accident before. David Renzi uh, has a question saying, again, a separate domain or a subdomain? David said, uh, hi all, I want your opinion about a web gaming portal. Within the portal, each game has its own pages with rules, rankings and access to the game. To get the best EO, what is best? Uh, one, uh, have third levels for each game, as in game dot game one dot example dot com. I think by third levels he means a, a subdomain. Um, he said have separate domains for each game, multiple for the same game, that maintain content and a link to the parent sites for uh, parent sites for access to the game. Uh, brackets game one dot com another game one dot com. Uh, and three uh, uh, have um, the um, solution one and two um, taking care to publish different contents or by instructing the search engines on which is the canonical URL. Um, how do you think uh, is the best approach for this? What do you think? So, uh, I don't know if I've missed something, but I think we're overthinking this. Game.com is the domain then your next section would be game.com forward slash game one. That would be that category page and everything about that page, that game one and instructions and how to log in and blah, blah, blah. Then it would be forward slash game two. Or, or have I just missed the entire point yeah. No, I, don't no, I think, think, yeah, I think we're all screaming subdirectories. <laughs> Yeah, I wouldn't recommend the subdirectories, and I wouldn't recommend the additional domains. I think you know he is overthinking it a little bit. You know, you've got the capability of taking advantage of multiple games on your website, and then having additional promotions. You know, maybe that person likes this game, but also might be interested in this game. So maybe there's an advertisement on the page to go to that section of the website in the subfolder. Yeah. So I think. In a sense, it's neither one or neither one nor two. Um, you know, in this scheme, I mean, because you will have a lot of subdomains, or you're going to have lots of domains. Um, you know, if you're going to have a domain for each game, that's going to be a lot of that's going to be a lot of domains to maintain and pay for. Yeah. And we maintain. We're, we're sorry to interrupt there, Mr. Taki. William Rock is leaving us. Uh, thank you, William. Uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Okay, Mr. Taki, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Oh, no, no, no problems. Um, you know, as I said, it's it's going to cost money, and it's going to be a bother maintaining all of them. Um, so those are issues to begin with. Um, Subdomains. Um, I. As Tim mentioned, I would sort of, I think in this instance, I would prefer sub uh, subdirectories rather than subdomains. Um, subdomains, I suppose, is a possibility. But I 
I don't know. It, it, I'm not 100% sure what you would gain from using um, subdomains in this instance. No, I, 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 I agree with you all. And it, it would be much better to, a, sim, a simple domain with uh, subfolders. Yeah, I, I, I think so too. But the, I, I guess the, 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 the only thing in terms of the subdomain that I can think of is um, the, the idea that someone coming back to play um, Turbo Tiddlywinks or something might like to go to turbo .game .com. um but uh, i don't see any uh, seo advantage over it um i think yeah I, I i'm very much for thinking keeping things simple um makes 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 life simpler in most cases <clears throat> excuse me <coughs> excuse me while i die <clears throat> Anybody else? All right, uh, let's um, move um, to the next. This one from Dan Marine. It's titled Assembling Title Tags, Metas and Page Titles for my store. Dan said that I am assembling the title tags, metas and page titles for my store. My question is uh, with regards to sizes of a product. I have a title tag that might might read Soraya Mystique Rug dash M64 dash two feet by three feet um, in torp. You know what colour torp is, Tim? Anyway, this is what you will see on Google. Then when I'm on the product page, the customer will see Soraya Floor Coverings Mystique Rug M64 in Torp at uh, a company as the uh, page uh, title. I have a concern on the size because if the customer lands on the product page, they will in fact see a two by three rug that they saw on the title tag, but the page title will not show the size. I had to do this because the product page has options for size so if the customer selects a different rug size then the page title um, will always read two by three no matter what size they choose i would rather not see the size for this reason is it okay to not have the size on the page title um, for this reason thank you Um, I, uh, I think, I think this is getting overcomplicated as we say quite often, uh, on dumb SEO questions. Um, I think that, um, I think the thing with title tags is that in most cases you don't see the damn things or you only see a little bit of them. Um, even if you do, uh, look up into the, uh, into the tab part of your your browser so i'm i tend not to get my knickers in a twist too much um about this idea of um someone reading uh reading a a, a title tag and looking for two foot by three foot or something um i think that um uh, i I was concerned to begin with that uh, that Dan was setting up a site that had a uh, a page for every uh, for every variation on every rug. So that size um, I don't know what M sixty four is, um, but uh, whether that's a um, uh, a variation or whether that just uh, just identifies the mystique rug, the Surya mystique rug. Um, but obviously they come in two by three and other variations in size. So, um, yes, I, I, we've talked about this before. Um, having um, the main 
uh, the main identifier for this thing, which is probably Surya Mystique Rug M64. Not sure what M64 is. Um, but uh, and then. Uh, sorry? It seems to me it's probably an SKU. Uh, possibly. Possibly doesn't need to be there then. <laughs> um, yeah, may maybe it is. Um, Anyway, so you'd have a page for Surya uh, Mystique Rug and you'd have pull downs for color and you'd have pull downs or pattern perhaps um, or perhaps even material in some cases um, and then um, and then size. Uh, then you can put lots of good um, content on fewer pages. It'll make the whole content and, and non-duplication um, deduplication, no, it's not deduplication unless you du duplicate in the first place, non-duplication of content easier. So um, I wouldn't worry about two by three rugs um, in the title tag. Um, I would get your, um, I would get some really nice photographs and some really good um, lifestyle-y type um, uh, content in there something that will will get people excited about your rugs um and do that um but yeah don't go down the don't go down the route of thinking that you have to have uh unique um unique title tags and therefore that means you have to have a page for every single uh, variation of every single product um structure it so you've got the main the main thing it's a rug it's got a picture of donald duck on it um and it's made out of wool um that's the thing but you know whether it comes in two by three or 18 by 12 um you know that's that's a variation within the donald duck um um rug um that makes sense Tim, yeah. I'm sure you've got something else to say or something to say. Yeah, no, I would totally go with one rug, the Mystique rug. <laughs> um, totally go with one page for your Mystique rug, like David said. And then uh, depending on what your CMS is, you should be able to then, you know, people can select the size, two by three, two by four, two by six, whatever, um, which allows you then to concentrate on your one product page for the Surya Mystique rug, right? Um, really describe it, its origin, how you're making it. You really go into it. Um, and the best thing I can advise you here, um, when, when, when looking at an actual product itself, is think about if someone came into your shop and the only thing you were allowed to say to that person walking into your shop was reading out what you have written in that product description. And at the end of the day, thinking, would what I have put there made the sale, right? So transfer how you would deal with that product in a real world situation onto that product. What, you know, it's, it's, it's fiber. If you use some brilliant kind of triple weave stitch, talk about that you like the only guys that use this triple weave stitch still you know this this originated back in ancient i'm going to say surya and um you know create the story around it create the 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 the, the, the desire to want this rug um and even it did, uh, like, like dave mentioned a video you know even a video of you um displaying this rug because you know images are great yeah fine but even embedding a, a video onto the product page about the, the rug, rolling it out, you know, giving it a little sales pitch there. Oh, feel this triple weave rug. Look how beautiful it looks. Glistens in the sunlight kind of shit, you know. Um, so, and that way you're concentrating on one product and then people can drop down and use their different sizes or different colors. Uh, yeah. And th that way you have one product to really put your energy into um, and users 
and, and Google will appreciate that. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and I think the question is that he has a title tag on this page with, you know, in the title tag um, with, with M64 size color information. Um, but the actual page title doesn't contain that because people can choose a different size um, and perhaps different color. It's the same rug, but in different size and perhaps different color. Um, so I personally would remove the M64 size and color because in a sense from the title, because if you're doing that, and if that's shown in Google, you would, you might be targeting the narrow section of people who are looking for exactly that size, exactly that color rug, right? Whereas you on this page or via this page, you're selling different types, different sizes and different colors. And you're excluding people. People will think, oh, two by three. Oh, that's not the size I'm looking for. They won't click through. Oh, this isn't the color I'm looking for. It sounds like an interesting rug. It might be, you know, something I'd be interested in if it's in a different color. But the title says this, I'm not going to click through. So as Tim said, it'd be far better if you can say what's unique, what's so great about the rug. So people might think, oh, I'm looking for a rug. This sounds interesting. I'm going to click through. I'm going to see what sizes they have, what colors they have, and decide whether I want to buy one or not. So I personally would remove the M64 two by three Toby information from the title tag. Yeah, and the color as well, surely. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, Surya Mystique rug. And if you wanted to then, if it was something unique about it, <laughs> triple weaved, triple weaved by, and then obviously your brand name, triple weaved by Dan Marine, you know. Um, did you by any chance get these rugs when you were out in uh, Afghan? <laughs> Sorry, mate, just just a joke, but you, you'll get my you'll get my joke. <laughs> okay, all right, we've we've all had a say on that one. Let's go to the next. This is from um, Jenny. Um, running a business called Living Gratitude. Um, and she said, uh, <laughs> I, I, I'm not sure if they appear on the film script uh, or not, uh, David. Um, anyway, she said, can, can I generate backlinks by posting on any type of website? She goes on to say, greetings from Jenny. Uh, can, um, I need to have a niche of website blogs or backlinks or should backlinks uh, be only through similar niche sites or blogs. For example, I have a blog on the pharma sector. Can I uh, generate uh, backlinks by commenting uh, on any website or blog, um, even if it was travel or tourism, money making, coal, IT, technology, etc.? Or should I generate by comment, commenting only on the pharma sector related websites and blogs? Um, and please uh, make your suggestions. Thanks, Jenny Kelly. Jenny, you're killing me, darling. You're flipping killing me. Right. <laughs> so, look, Jenny, so the first thing I want you to do is to search for Google's quality update. Y M Y A and E A T. Okay. So firstly, the pharma sector, right, is pretty much in what Google considers your money or your life, right? Sector, which means uh it literally, you know, could impact someone's life depending on what advice or product is being sold in these sectors. Okay. So this is the first thing you need to, 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 to go and understand how Google views your, um, how, how Google is going to be looking at your kind of uh, sector, right? The next thing for you to look at is 
look at Google Webmaster Quality Guidelines regarding links, okay? Um, and then that would answer your next big, you know, your, your next thing about chucking these in, you know, just willy-nilly throwing these links about and what Google's going to think about them. Um, and then your next to actually answer your question, if you hadn't already by starting to, to, to read about the sector you're in, how Google views you, as well as, you know, uh, the quality guidelines in terms of links. Um, if that hadn't answered your question, then your next one is, if you were going to go and chuck a blog somewhere, which firstly, you'll notice that is not called natural because you're throwing it on somewhere and it's not editorially controlled by whoever's publishing that link um, is not considered natural. But if you were going to shove uh, an article about, I don't know what you do um, in your pharma sector, Viagra, let's say, um, or some hippy dippy version of Viagra uh, onto a travel website, right? What what in the first place would make a travel website want to publish that? This is my first question. And if a travel website did publish it, even if you spun the best kind of article you could about, I don't know, traveling to Ibiza and, and, and having the best time of your life and staying in this hotel, that hotel, we recommend eating here and then pop in your hippy dippy Viagra bought from us. Um, I just wouldn't see a reputable a reputable or authoritative blog in any other genre publishing something, no matter how you spin that article uh, into publishing it. And if they did, that just wouldn't be worth the HTML it's 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 printed in. <laughs> because I'm like, in what in what planet would, would would somebody reading in an you know reading about their next holiday then want to read an article on some pharma product? Yeah, I'm like, it just doesn't make sense. And if you think of it from that sense, you know, one Google would just look at this and go, Jesus, that's crap. Should we just you know, uh, <laughs> and 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 so would readers. One thing I would urge you to think about now is when you're looking at publishing something somewhere else, is what is that going to do for you? What is that article that you had published somewhere else going to do for you? And if you just say a link, well, then you are literally looking at this entire online, uh, you know, uh, online ecosphere in the completely wrong light. If you are going to spend time and effort in having something published somewhere, the least you want back from that is traffic and people coming from one place in the in the same kind of uh, uh, say, say, you know in the same kind of marketplace that had thought, wow, I've read that article, great, I'm gonna click through to that, and now, because this is where I can I can buy it, or I can read more about the company before I make a decision on buying it or something like that. Um, and, and this is generally what, you know, you, you we call marketing, you know, if you, if you, um, if, if you, and I'll give you just a perfect example on what, what, what happened uh, the other day, and it just works completely in the in the whole online. Just to give you an idea, um, I read an article uh, online about this little girl who had horrendous eczema, and she used this Australian-based product. I think it was called Gumu or Mugu, right? Just all natural kind of soaps and stuff like this, and and it cleared up. And I was like, wow, that's amazing. I was literally uh, chatting to a friend a week or two later. Um, it was when we had our heat wave in the, in the UK. And yeah, we, we did have one. We did have one. Apparently it's coming back, but we did have day, one. Which day was that, Tim? <laughs> yeah, so it was a hot day. 
And uh, I was walking with a friend who gets, what do they call it, heat rash or whatever, really sensitive heat rash. And I said, hey, you know what, this Mugu, this is the same thing the way the online world works is somebody sees a product and then something resonates with someone. You provide something of interest, of value to a reader, to someone, they find it, and then they follow it through or mention your product or your company in an article, whether they share it socially, whether they incorporate it into an article, like the original article that I read, right? And now I've gone and shared it. And this is what you need to start looking at is one, I'm only going to spend the time and energy in marketing my, 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 my brand and my product in places where my readers would, where readers uh, in my genre would benefit from that, move through and actually either interact or engage. If you've posted something somewhere where you've literally never had a, had a click come back from them, then it was just a waste of time. Yeah. Thank you, Tim. Um, totally agree. All right, let's um, go to the next. Um, let me see. Um, press that button. Ali Dark wants to know. It's it's a it's a titled it's titled. Will hosting my site images on another host have negative effects on my SEO? Ali said, hey guys, I have a question about image hosting SEO. So I have to host one dash mysite.com and two dash cdn.mysite.com. The first one is my main host, which my site is currently running um, with WordPress, um, but I have a limited host space. The second host is my download host. I don't know what I should call it, uh, CDN uh, FTP remote. I usually upload big files there uh, to uh, avoid running space, running out of space in my main host. Now I want to connect WordPress media upload to my second host so that my site image, images load from this, this link. Uh, CDN.mysite.com, uh, expect mysite.com. But I heard and now wonder is hosting my site images on another host uh, have negative effects on my uh, host's SEO. Um, sorry for the bad English and I'm sorry for the bad read. Um, all right. Um, who's got an answer for Ali? <laughs> Um, I don't think it should matter too much. Um, so long as Google associates the image with a particular page on your site. Yeah, that's true. I, I don't think it should <clears throat> make any difference at all. Um, because um, the uh, the page, uh, sorry, the <coughs> the uh, images uh, cdn.mysite.com will appear on the <coughs> the my uh, pages on mysite.com. The the potential problem that I can see is that it might slow things down a bit, um, and that uh, could be a uh, a negative effect on your uh, site's, uh, site's uh, performance because uh, Google, of course, has started um, being concerned about uh, about how quick a, um, a site is or, or even how quick a page is. So um, I'd be careful um, and have a look on GT Metrics or something, do some tests, see, see what's going to happen because... If it's going to slow things down, uh, then uh, it's not a good thing. Yeah. Um, well, yeah, look, I, I don't know uh, what uh, Ali um, is concerned about. I mean, 
most bigger sites uh, these days use a CDN for, for their images. Um, anyone that uses WordPress uh, draws their scripts from um, another source and um, um, there's just so much, um, you know, that's served from other services. I, I don't see any negative effects at all. All right. Um, anybody else? Uh, let me just see if there was any comments. Um, no. Okay, that was on our Google Plus site. But right, let me move to the next. This one uh, is from Annie Singer. Um, it's uh, titled My Medical Slash Health Site um, was hit um, a big time by the Medic Update. We have a resident medic expert uh, um, in the house. Um, my medical slash health site got hit big, big time, so I've been making changes. We have tons of very, very similar content that has no unique value, so I started trimming pages that are almost identical. For now, I have no index slash no followed, um, canonicalized, and requested to remove from Google a small number of pages. This is one of the pages I have no index slash no followed and requested to remove from Google uh, on August the 13th for the date range of August the 14th and 19th compared to August 7th, 12. Um, why, if I no index, no followed, canonicalized and requested for removal, would there be a more than 900% uh, increase uh, in clicks and an 1,800% increase in impressions. You see Dave Elliott, uh, another one of our forum heroes that uh, looks after um, our, our people on the uh, Facebook group through the week. Dave uh, said this week he spends his time uh, on his mobile late at night uh, answering those questions. And for that, we thank Dave uh, very much. George G, who would know the answer, uh, said that Canonical takes over uh, uh, no index if the bot sees both. Must be a lot of sites affected by the medic uh, update. Uh, anybody got any insights on that? All right, let's um, call that answered and go to the next. Tatsat Sani, um, will user engagement drop off uh, if the article is longer than 500 words. That said, said uh, we, I need suggestions. I hired a content, content writer who has been providing articles in two parts, um, like Properties of XYZ Part 1 and Properties of XYZ Part 2, each about uh, 500 words. I asked him the reason uh, for doing this, and he said, that user engagement drops off if the article is longer than 500 words. Um, I really don't believe that. I have a page with more than 3,000 words and it gives the highest conversion. But I still wanted to make sure if what he says is true and why he is saying so. This will have to be very quick because I've got to go. Um, if the quality of the uh, of the copy is good, then there should be no problem um, with uh, articles longer than 500 words. Um, get the right stuff and feed it to uh, your audience. Um, unless your audience suffers from ADHD, you should be able to get them um, <clears throat> um, reading 
much more than uh, 500 words. Your 1,000 plus plus word um, piece is, uh, oh, no, no, no. Sorry, you've just, like, this has just moved, hasn't it? Or have I just misunderstood what was going on? But, you know, the drop-off, um, it, sh it shouldn't drop off. You know, there's, uh, um, get some nice, good, well-written content and your audience and google should love you um that's it i could go on all day but i need to be somewhere else sorry about that um, no problem Dave. Uh, uh, week uh, after uh, next <laughs> yeah. okay all right safe journey to your appointment david okay thanks bye bye All right. Um, yeah, we we all agree. Um, user engagement um, shouldn't drop off. It's dependent um, on the uh, content and, and the way it's written, not how much of it is written. Um, anybody else on that one before we move on? Okay. So next one from J L Faveria. Uh, it's titled, Is This the Recommended Way to Get Rid of Spam URLs? Um, JL said, uh, I've added the following to the HT access file. Redirect gone, um, slash buy dash zopiclone dash tablets dash UK. Um, What does that mean? Has uh, uh, JL Faverio been hacked and um, has that page or is somebody just trying to access that page at his site? Um, I'd say hacked. Certainly the first person who made a comment said uh, hacked. Um, oh, yeah, JL said, uh, yes, we have. Uh, how, how long should I leave these URLs in the HD access file? And Lisa Brown, uh, who we thank uh, for her input on uh, Facebook, um, said um, indefinitely or until the URLs aren't in the index. If you were alerted to the hack in Google Search Console and you submitted that you'd fixed the problem, it might not take too long. Any comments? No. I, I, I just want to make a comment about uh, the people using the um, remove URLs in, in the, in the, in the um, uh, Google Search Console. That, that was really designed for uh, um, sensitive data that had been accidentally published. Um, and getting it removed from the index as quickly as possible. It's really not, um, you know, useful to use it as a form of sculpting. Anyway, well, in this case, there, if it, if the site had been hacked, then it does make sense to um, remove it, doesn't it? Even though you know the page no longer exists and there is no damage to visitors going to that particular page, but still it makes sense to get rid of that page from the index as quickly as possible. Well, sure, surely the, the, um, the, 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 the um, HT access line, uh, which is, is effectively saying to Googlebot, uh, it's 410, um, it's gone. Um, I would have thought that that, that would be enough. Yeah, but maybe. But, uh, I think, I think, Anecdotally, um, it might take a while before Google actually removes things from the um, index. You know, if if something returns four, 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 ten a few times, um, my feeling is that Google bots will keep coming back to see if that four, 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 ten was really what the webmaster had intended. Um, um, I'm seeing quite a lot of you know, I returned four, ten on certain things and I still see Googlebot looking for it. Yep, you're right. And they do. Okay. 
All right, let's um, slip on to the next. And this one is number 19 on our list. Um, it's from Nakul Gerga, Gerja. Uh, and Nakul said, uh, how to get on the first page without backlinks and content marketing. Mm. Well, you know, ultimately, when you say content marketing, you know, you still need to be providing your own content. Like Michael said, look, uh, you've generally got to if if you are competing with against uh, you know another site or sites uh, for specific queries genres. You generally need to provide um, something that's a bit more compelling and unique to to you know users. Why else would they stop visiting one site uh, and start visiting yours when you guys are doing pretty much the same? So, you know, if you are like a, a business to business kind of thing, you need to then obviously position yourself in terms with your content as type of an expert in the field, whereas the others may just, you know, be creating uh, a general kind of thing about it. You need to start then maybe think about positioning yourself, possibly create better case studies, uh, business models, tech specs or whatever. Um, if you are in a kind of an e-commerce field, then you want to start um, providing better user experience than the than, than the next one in terms of answering the user's query uh, or the intent on why they are looking for that particular product. If you can understand what um, the user's intent is and provide content at the different stages of that user's intent. Um, so are they looking for a film? Have they, you know, so you're providing content if in the stage that they're looking or researching a product. You're providing content in at the stage where they're narrowing down the specific product. And then you're providing them uh, information about the product once they've already, just, once they've decided to purchase. Um, so, you know, you need to look at those kind of levels and provide different, dip, obviously, depending on what you're in, you know, what, what genre or, or, you know, what space you're in, um, and provide something that's better that will attract users away that will come and have a look. And because you're providing something that's a little bit better, more unique, more understanding provides better information then the other guy they don't go back or they might do every now and again but you, uh, you are now seen as the authority uh for that particular product or service so yeah uh that that's how it's done thank you tim all right uh let's we're nearly there we're, we're just about to open up question 20 well i think we've got 22 to do ryan keller asks a question titled Google My Business Stacking uh, for Local Map Boosts. Um, he begins with a disclaimer. He said, I'm not interested in implementing this technique as I believe it to be grey hat or black hat. I just want to understand it. Okay, so I know about domain stacking, um, but I just heard about Google My Business Stacking for Local Map Boosts. Um, what is it? How is it? Uh, I assume it's just uh, as pointless uh, as a, an effort to, as domain stacking slash crowding. I've never heard of it before now, and all of my Google searches ultimately lead me to a, a Fiverr campaign. That alone makes me not okay with it. Just trying to understand if it is a thing. Does anyone have any insights? Uh, 
Oh. <laughs> so, essentially, it's not actually like in the sense of um, business listing stacking because that literally can't be done. Um, uh, yeah, and even if it was done, it's not in the traditional kind of web 2.0 domain stacking crap. Um, so it, it's it's not in that in that sense. Um, it's generally creating shitty maps, you know, creating your own shitty maps uh, onto another domain, um, like a like a local landing kind of page doorway page if you want then based on that you create in citations for it and then creating a gmb page around it um and then ultimately all of them are just doorway pages for the main kind of lead gen sort of business um it's a complete load of twaddle um the stuff you see on fiverr is they create sometimes they'll create crappy little um maps for you so they will so let's say you're a plumber they'll create like a plumber map and all these different plumbers are pinned into the map in the location and then your one's also included you know uh, well unless you including that map into a resource <laughs> somewhere it's not going to be visible so it needs to be included in some kind of decent resource uh, in fact i use those kind of maps specifically for users especially in the travel industry but they're relative to and and, and they provide uh, they provide an actual map you know a travel walking map of chiang mai or of or, or phuket or wherever you know best restaurants to, to to visit yeah brilliant great it's a map i can follow it but something like that it's just crap it's like who wants it because gmb does the exact same thing i want a plumber boom gives you the whole thing in maps so why go and create another one it's just it's just a load of shit. um yeah, uh, mate, it's it's a load of twaddle. And if you actually go down the actual, the other way, you're just essentially creating doorway pages, uh, lead gen back to the main business, or ultimately you could just be trying to sell the lead gen. So you've created a little domain, um, you've uh, business listings, then, then got um, a GMB page and it's a service area and you've pushed it higher up um, and in, you could either then use a redirect to yours or then um, or then start selling the lead gen when it gets into the top five. Uh, then you just start approaching plumbers or locksmiths and say, listen, it's a hundred buck, a hundred bucks, you know, for, for um, uh, the lead. What, what do you want? You know, we'll switch it to your site. We'll switch it to you. You can have all these hundred bucks a lead, whatever, or, uh, you know, 5,000 a month or whatever the case may be. So, yeah, but anyway, it's all a load of bollocks, uh, especially the stuff you see on Fiverr. Um, there are some pretty sophisticated ways of doing, you know, the whole lead gen thing, but um, Google's increasingly crack, crack you know, um, stamping on these. Um, yeah, and Google's become very, very um, tough this year. And in fact, they do not hesitate to take you to court with the um, FTC also now, um, and yeah, they will they, they will sue you for for revenues also. So yeah, they they've done this 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 year. They are massively stamping down. So if you do intend to do this, just make sure you got the wallet to back it up. Right, is that um, taking people to court? Is that you, just US only or? Uh... Yeah, US at the no, US at the minute, but if they can prove the third party or the the, the, the scammers um, generated any kind of revenue from it, depending on wherever they are, they'll take action, uh, build the case, um, and take it to court within that country. Well, yeah, they're not messing about anymore. You must remember, uh, GMB is being monetized big time. So that's going to be rolling out globally. And when the money's involved, they've got to protect the money. So you're just now starting to get into the realms of if you're messing with their revenue, they're going to have you. Okay. So how, how is that going to work? That's 
that's that's sort of news, isn't it? That, that GMB is being monetized. No, because uh, LSA has been running now in the states for a uh, year and a half now. They oh. are, huh? Okay. Local service ads. LSA has been running in the states for about a year and a half now. They are getting ready to roll it out in the UK next, and then it'll be pretty much rolling out as they go country by country. Um, it'll be yeah, be rolling out. Yeah, it's it's coming. Big time. So what are they doing in the UK? They're going, once Brexit comes, there won't be any money left, will it? Ah, you're a knob. <laughs> you're a knob. <laughs> There'll be plenty of money. Plenty. <laughs> All right, let's uh, go to the next number, 21. Uh, Rami Moscovich. Uh, Ask the question title, how do you use Google Search Console to improve SEO? What reports uh, in there are important to observe to see that everything is intact? How do I see that the sitemap is de defined in an optimal way? Thanks. All right. Um, so yeah, look, uh, the general off the cuff search console. Yeah, you can you can use it in um, tons of ways. So obviously, you know, on the base level, if you're looking in your and your search analytics section, on the base level, it's going to say um, the query, the impressions of where you're already kind of, you know, if you, and then uh, an average position. So you can use it for things like, um, you, you can get an idea where, you know, where you're sort of averaging. Um, but then let's say you've got a, a short tail query and you're averaging position 12.5 and there's some very good impressions there. You can actually then start to, to work your way around it so you can then filter by search query so you can filter by how what where when right and you can then see if your content has appeared for some something like okay um so let's say your money term is pink fluffy elephants impressions i don't know fifteen thousand impressions and your average position is 12.5 now that's your money term you already know that because you've got a page on pink fluffy elephants but it's like, okay, um, yeah, so what's going on? So you filter by search query and say how. And then all of a sudden you see you've actually appeared for how to watch a pink fluffy elephant, right? Impressions may be 1,000 and your position 77, okay? And you're like, actually, because, you know, you've talked in your pink fluffy elephant page a little bit about it, uh, you know, you, the, in your product, you can, you like, you maybe just mentioned, oh, these are quick and easy to wash in the washing machine. But because of that, now you've filtered it, it says how, and you've seen, oh, actually, I appear for how to wash your pink fluffy elephant. A, hundred, a, a thousand impressions, but you're on position averaging 77. So there's your first, brilliant. That's your first next piece of content how to wash your pink fluffy elephant, right? You answer it, you provide, you know, some good stuff in there. You talk about different temperatures and washing your pink fluffy, what the optimal temperature is for washing the pink fluffy elephant. Even create a video if you want to, embed that into it on how to wash your pink fluffy elephant. Really go to town in answering that, you know, all those potential things. And then also don't just think about, you know, but really go to town. Oh, what happens if I shrunk my pink fluffy elephant because I washed it? So then actually go into possible possible ways of recovering your pink fluffy elephant from, you know, like a hot wash or whatever the case may be. So you really create a really good guide that answers those as well as other potential situations within that query. Next minute next minute you're appearing either position one or two for that boom you've sorted that one out 
Um, so then you can use things like the where search query, house search query, right? You can start filtering and seeing how Google perceives you already and opportunities where to improve. I hope that helps you out. Thank you, Tim. All right, so let's go to um, the next. Scott Smith uh, gives us an easy one to finish off with, Tim. Uh, he said, hello, what is orphan content? How do I resolve that issue? Um, can anyone help? Okay, so generally reports or SEO tools throw up this term orphaned, right? When, because a page is appearing in your site, it it appears in your sitemap, um, which, which of course, um, you know, these tools use. But because it was just created as a random page, it's not actually within the structure of the site. So you, there's no actual way to get to it in the sense of, um, you know, it may have been linked from an article somewhere, but it's not actually in the main structure and navigation of your site, which technically means, so it's listed in your, 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 your site maps and, or maybe even not, maybe it used to appear and you just removed it, but it's still, crawlable still visible and the tools find it and it's like well you're not in the site map you're not in the navigation therefore it's kind of orphaned right um so it's not something that's going to it's not something that's going to uh necessarily impact a site uh, in that sense but i would certainly look at them and say um, well, what was the point of this page? Do I still need this page? Uh, and you can certainly check that out by looking, you know, in your analytics, look over a year and say, well, how many visits did I have? I mean, literally over a year, if you had between zero and 10 visits in a year, um, zero and 20, then you'd be like, well, do I need it? Um, if it is getting any kind of, should I, actually find a place for it in the navigation or should I take it down and redirect whatever was there to the next logical place um, I've never seen a significant issue with orphaned content but then again I've never taken on like a site that may have had 50,000 so for example orphan pages that would be an issue because there's literally tons of these pages hanging about out there doing you know with with no structure um because there's no structure there's no actual invisible means for the the user and it could be viewed badly by google possibly as doorway pages or things like this um but, you know, if you just had one or two that someone wrote about or whatever the case may be, see how you can incorporate that back uh, into the site. If it's good, if it gets traffic, if not, get rid of it. Or uh, if it does get a little bit and it is of value, then put it back into the nav or just uh, remove and redirect. Yeah. So th that's generally how it's seen as uh, from crawlers, you know, from uh, tools, SEO tools. Thank you, Tim. Okay, I think we've made it. I think we've done it again. Just let me see. Yes, it is that time. It's thank you for watching time. Um, look, uh, we're not streaming uh, now, but um, if you're watching this uh, on YouTube at, at, at some later time, we thank you for your interest. We, we thank you uh, most sincerely. Um, you your interest in what we do makes uh, what we do worthwhile we'll be back uh, at the same time next week uh, to do this uh, all again but for now it's uh, good night